Welcome back to the Remedial Film Class Podcast. I'm your host, Dan. And I'm Travis. I'm George. And I'm Richard. Hey, hey Richard. Hello, Richard's Richard. Back. Hey. Oh, to be a oh. fly on the wall of the... Oh, actually, we're recording this, so we're all kind of flies <laughs> on the wall. We George, the wall. you just finished up maybe the most extreme body horror of the mid-80s. How are you holding up? Is that right? How's your appetite? <laughs> Do you want a cheeseburger? You want any donuts? Ooh, cheeseburger. A cheeseburger. <laughs> I could go for a cheeseburger right now. He could go for yeah. a Gina Davis right now, probably. Yeah, that too. <laughs> <laughs> yep. She she I mean, she was like in her prime in this film. I mean they both were, to be fair. Yes. There is very... n- there is nothing as good as that relationship from an eighties film. Did you hear the story that she actually they didn't want her and Goldblum suggested her and uh Cronenberg and all of them were like uh yeah we're not really keen on the because they were in a relationship before yes, the movie yes yes yeah. and they're like we're not really sure because if the relationship goes bad and you're still doing the movie and then she came in and did the reading and she was the first one that did the reading Cronenberg's like yeah we should probably sign her up now <laughs> so she nailed made it. the right choice who who else was in the running do we know they didn't he the what I saw they didn't mention other names but they Madonna. they wound up they just they just who was I was you say, didn't say Madonna. Madonna. Did you? <laughs> oh I, I, I made that up. That would have been okay. insane. <laughs> but it was around that sort of time she was doing films. Yes, so that, that would yes. have been hilarious. Oof. I like that Madonna's Jeff Goldblum was still Wolf. rocking the same hair that he had in uh, Death Wish. So that's cool. Mm. That's some cool hair. I mean, yeah. that that is the Jeff Goldblum look. This is the classic Jeff Goldblum look. This See, film, and- surely. People my age only know him as Malcolm from Jurassic Park and onward, so this is right a bit unrefined, I would say. No, I knew him from Transylvania 65,000. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> this is proto gold bloom. Yeah. This is the real stuff. And the big stuff. chill. I knew him from the big chill. My parents were awesome. <laughs> I think this is the first film I saw him in, actually, uh, okay. certainly that I can remember, so... Uh, he he was very awesome in it though, so yeah, we'll, we're we're going to talk about it, I guess. Yeah, he was also in Invasion of the Body Snatchers, so he's been the, around a while. The the remake with Donald remake. Sutherland, yes. Um, I haven't seen that for years either. I just oh, know we'll the be memes. doing that one eventually. So you'll be. If on only there was some <laughs> sound I could make with my mouth to express my surprise <laughs> and horror that you haven't seen that movie in a long time. Right. Wow. If only, uh, I guess we'll miss that opportunity. Hey, George, this is your first David Cronenberg yeah. movie, unless you count his appearance in Jason X. How do you compare The Fly to Jason X? <laughs> Does, uh, it? Does it? I, I mean, I don't remember really liking Jason X all that much. And He was the best part of that movie. <laughs> I'm sure that I have a different opinion on The Fly than you guys. You might. So... I don't know, pretty comparable, maybe? I'm not sure. Whoa, hold on. Oh, hold on. Hold on. Uh-oh. Yeah. <laughs> Stop the train. Do I have to throw my page of notes out yeah, again? I think, I think maybe you guys are, uh, are, are bitten by a little bit of the nostalgia bug on this one. I that, don't know. That if, if you guys this, saw is, this is today. not the show I signed up for. I'm I'm out of here, guys. If we're not <laughs> we're not just full on nostalgia and hair, I'm out of here. This yeah, hey, listen. <laughs> this is what we do here. Um I'm probably wrong as usual. So definitely this, is, wrong. this is a Robocop moment. Yeah. 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 Definitely. Totally. So George, oh, you mean oh, oh, that oh. when the opening credits of this movie hit and it looks like something straight off of like mid nineties TV, uh like brought to you by Stargate. The movie The Fly. You're not immediately like, oh, check I'm out that awesome computer graphic. You, you didn't have any uh, <laughs> nothing? No, because I, I don't know. Okay, but let's just no talk reference. about I don't know. the score. Surely the score excited you. Surely you were like, this isn't just some electro nonsense from Italy. This Wait, is was... a real orchestra. There was a score? <laughs> uh... That's what he's like. <laughs> I don't, I don't remember. What the music's the, so good. Okay, well, yeah, okay. That's, it reminded uh, me a lot of the uh, the the same score in like Hellraiser and stuff. Exactly like, that. You've got yeah. like kind of minor key. It's slightly yeah. John Williamsy, but probably like the budget budget John Williams. Like uh, they obviously didn't have the budget for him. Uh, yeah, it was sure just John it, William. Yeah. Was yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, my name's John Will. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Willem. <laughs> Willem. <laughs> I'm famous for Jaws 4. Uh, yeah, you're I, in. Yeah. You're in straight away. I mean, I think I know what George's hangs, hang-ups are. It, so, yeah. I, I mean, they're obvious. But are they? Are they? Let's yeah, hear I mean, what George's hangups are. Let's not assume his his hangups. Let's hear them, George. But, what's wrong? Uh, I'm I'm surprised this is your first Cronenberg though. So obviously you're not doing films in order. But for me, and I won't spoil it in case you go down this road in the future. I went out to uh, Amsterdam as a 14 year old, and it's the wrong time to go to Amsterdam mm. uh, with my mum uh, and my best friend, and we hired every horror film we could. So. That's when I saw Scanners and Videodrome mm-hmm. for the first time. And Videodrome freaked me out back then. Uh, Scanners was just like, oh my God, I love this film so much. This is because it had Patrick McGowan in it for, for mm. one. But uh, yeah, I mean, I already knew when I saw the titles of The Fly. This is David Cronenberg. I know what to expect. So George not knowing what to expect is a little bit of a kind of, um, eh, I don't know, firecracker, I guess, to start with. Well, we also purposely, I don't know if it was purposely, but we didn't show him the original that this is based on. So it's from 1958. It's like classic 1950s sci-fi, you know, your classic monster movie. Yeah. Uh, More Jekyll and Hyde. uh, Mm -hmm. Basically a story about, you know, a scientist, same thing. But it was more like a, a visual head switch. It wasn't like a metamorphosis that you watched. It was more like a, a a drama where a wife is helping her husband try to figure this out, and then she winds up killing him, and then she's accused of his murder, and then they try to figure out was she justified all this stuff. Okay, so, so it's a totally different movie. A hundred percent. It is way less yeah, Franz okay. Kafka and a lot more like nineteen fifties Cold War fear of science movie. Right. It was it was gotcha. ripe for George to fall asleep during, so we skipped yes. it. Yes. I but like he, it a lot, though. I might I like, like the too. original one better as a viewing experience yeah. just because it doesn't make me phys- physically ill, you know? Right. Like, I, I good... had to delay my dinner an hour because I watched <laughs> this movie right before dinner, and I was like, I'm just going to take a break. Like It's now Vienna's favorite movie. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> See, I, I mean, I, I had a nice... Old. Nice chicken curry while I was watching it. I'm not going to lie, right. and uh, <laughs> I'm I'm kind of hardened to it now uh, because I've watched it a couple of times this year. Right. Uh, but yeah, as a kid, yeah, I mean, we'll get into it. But it, the it things, was not... the things that I love about the original, will never change. It's it's almost like that Beauty and it's not. This one's more like Beauty and the Beast than that one. That one's more like a Jekyll and Hyde kind of, uh, you know, trying to figure out a cure and then it just, he just succumbs to the situation. Um a lot of the acting is is done under a hood. You're not really seeing any change. He's already the fly. He's got a hood over like a black sheet over his head and he interacts with her and they he knocks on the desk for yes and no. Yeah. But he gets to emote through those knocks and through his body language. This one takes that to the umpteenth level by basically showing his transformation from almost like a cancerous is, it's a it's a i would say a a, a brave thing to do yes. at the time it's it's i could tell watching the movie that that this is probably for its time like a really huge special it effects was undertaking a huge like it had to be yes um you know like i'm just thinking of some of the imagery that i that i know of like it reminded me of like the thing, mm-hmm. right? Uh, it reminded me of, uh, I don't know, maybe like a Total Recall, maybe a little bit of um, well, Total Recall, sure. Um, Effects wise, I was thinking um, The Exorcist, the like the makeup wise, mm-hmm. not really the special effects stuff, but um, yeah, um, I, I could tell that that this was probably you know for its time uh, a big deal. Now minus the special effects. Were you good with the character work? At at the at very first, the very first scene at the party, mm-hmm. um, when they're you know having their fir- very first conversation, and he's trying to like take her home and show her stuff. Um, I thought immediately I knew that these two characters, these two actors, have great chemistry, mm-hmm. right? And then the more the movie went on, the more I felt like he was acting 
much like the guy from freaking National Treasure. The hell's his name? Oh, Nicholas Cage. Yeah, he reminded me of Nicholas Cage, and I good. hate Nicholas Cage. <laughs> so, so for the characters, like, okay, she was great. But he wasn't doing it for me. Right. But the, he was but only really in it for, you know, I mean. I don't imagine, imagine if you yeah. will, a world where you didn't know who Jeff Goldblum was. Mm. And I don't have to imagine that. Mm. That is my world. <laughs> That's his world. <laughs> well, welcome <laughs> to a brighter and more quizzical world. But that's really what it was like. Everybody was kind of in the, you know, 70s and 80s movie characters were very two-dimensional and like mm -hmm. actors were always like heroes or villains and he was like the first kind of modern super geek i think right. uh i i would put it and His yeah deliveries uh, it, yeah it's it's brilliant for its time and if you hate it it's because you hate jeff goldblum and you're wrong uh, but <laughs> just just going back a, a little bit the, the makeup artist for the fly Chris uh, or one of them uh, well, a guy called Stephen Dupuis as well okay. came up, who also did makeup on RoboCop and Scanners. Uh, and I'm thinking of RoboCop, of the melty uh, face yes. scene, thinking yeah. mm -hmm. he probably has a formula for some sort of gunk, because I'm pretty sure now melty face man had the same gunk on him as we'll find out in the fly. It's it's not the 3M stuff, that's for sure. No, it's not 3M. <laughs> no. Well, I'm, I'm assuming they probably both worked with, with Rob. Was it Botin or Botine or Botine? Rob Botine, Botine was like the... Botin, yeah. Um, yeah, he was the, the main <laughs> the dude, The one right? pronunciation you didn't <laughs> I try. Didn't say. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I remember that from the original um, Robocop documentary back in the, yeah. in the 80s. So uh, I'm and right, I think, you're wrong. I think that you ask the, the, the pronunciation of his name every time every it time. comes up. Yeah, because I keep calling him... I keep saying Botine. Botine. Botine, yeah, you then, think it's Botine. Yeah. But what, it is spelled fine. Botin, though. So that it's it does Botin, make sense. it's spelled Botin. Yeah, so. that's right. Just think of him as a, he, he uses uh, 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 extracts from plants to get his, yes, you know, his stuff, so he's great. a botanist. <laughs> Botan. So pretty <clears throat> much anything he touches looks great. Yes. Um, but the the issue with the effects in this, because Chris Wallace is, is a friggin' genius. He's done Enemy Mine and Gremlins yeah. and Dragon Slayer. Like, he's one of, he's Tom Savini level, um, but he's of the era of puppeteering. Okay. So the the fact that they went that route with the fly creature mm -hmm. at the after he loses the skin, yep, that's where it always got a little hinky for me. Like I knew it looked, it looked cool for its time because I was ten, eleven when this came out, so I was maybe fourteen yeah. when I saw it. Yeah, uh, it looked cool for its time. I remember seeing on the cover of Fangoria magazine. I'm like, okay, it does look like a fly. But when you watch it, the whole story doesn't. Uh, it didn't need that. It probably could have been, if they were going to do the puppeteering thing, they could have done less of the legs and just kind of did what they did in Terminator where it's like a waist up puppet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. it yeah. doesn't really, uh, you're not, <laughs> you're not watching those legs and going, that's not holding any weight. Like, <laughs> You're it's going to got look at the that. strength of a fly. Right. Come on now. <laughs> to me, I always thought, because I wanted to be a special effects artist, so when I see movies like right. this, it kind of inspired me. And when I watched this movie back then, I tried to redesign it myself, and I thought it would have been probably better if he didn't look like a fly when his skin fell off, but it was actually his skeleton that was mutated when his skin fell off. So that way it wasn't yeah, like... you've put way more thought into this than yeah, I have. It, I can well, tell I, that I had the same problem with Men in Black. <laughs> like, when, when, the, when the thing is living inside the thing and then it loses its skin, it has to make sense. So when, when the bug comes out of the guy in Men in Black, it's like, okay, how was that friggin' bug inside that body? <laughs> same thing with this. It's like, okay, that's a fully developed I don't developed think fly. Men in Black was intended to be taken quite as No, soon. it's a comic book, right. But, but I, I get your point for sure. But when I saw that fly thing, I'm like, okay, because I always loved the original reveal. It was a yeah. complete and total fly head, and it yes. looks cool, and he had the one hand, and that was it. The rest of them was man. This was like, they went all in. And they were they were restricted by the 1986 puppeteering. They were, uh, but um, we as an audience, especially, we're fine with it. well, because I guess like me, you probably saw this on a TV on VHS because right. I was too young to go and see this in the cinema. Yep. So 
I saw this probably on a 21 inch color TV. Uh, oh, you had color? And, yeah, well, at this stage, I, I think we just about <laughs> had color, yeah. Uh, right. and, and on a VHS, so, you know, resolution of a potato. Uh, and it, it glosses over a lot of things. And because you're used to watching films in that resolution and that quality level, your brain kind of like interprets it as the mm -hmm. reality. So things looked much more real on VHS to us than than they do now because you you watch this on high def you're right none of the yeah. none of the kind of like puppeteer work comes out but you watch it on a 21 inch screen on VHS in 1987 uh, or 89 or whenever that shit looks great mm. exactly <laughs> but it's to be, smooth yeah. it's blended it's perfect <laughs> to be fair like I watched the Terminator which is 1984 three or four yeah, yeah. three three okay. 84 83 they did the same thing, the puppeteering. That's Stan friggin' Winston. That is the, that's the Lawrence Olivier. Is that actually his effects. middle name, friggin'? I think yeah. that would be. So yeah, it's it like, should be. Mm -hmm. It should be. So he was restricted to that, that stuff. And yes, when you watch the thing, and you're like, okay, I'm going to compare everything to the thing, or I'm going to compare everything to American Werewolf, and it's like they were still restricted to the same things, but they just knew film wise, the directors knew how to capture it better, mm -hmm. and I think Cronenberg yeah. was more about just showing it. I'm going to show yeah. you this. Yeah, Cronenberg and, and, in this movie really hit me as doing like a Lucio Fulci kind of thing, where it's like, you think yeah. I'm going to cut. Mm -mm. Nope, look, mm -hmm. ooh, we're still looking. <laughs> you think yeah. we're going to cut, but no, we're still looking. Like La it's Landis was about... We're still looking. Right, Landis was about the, the quick cut and all that stuff, but then he was also faithful to his special effects artist when mm -hmm. he did the full transformation in broad daylight yo where the werewolf transformation is right. by far my favorite special effects scene of all time and that was that you guys have ever shown shown me yeah yep. well to to richard's point i think we've had this conversation more than once um we've at least had it i know when we were watching hellraiser, hellraiser when yeah. there was a there was a monster that was clearly on a shopping cart yes um in my in my do DVD not ruin version. that film for me do and, not ruin that film i and, love that film it, it was a hand truck, but yeah, uh, whatever, cart. whatever. <laughs> um, and uh, there was another one uh, that was very much like, oh, the RC car from um, oh, and the thing from the thing, yeah, you know, where you can clearly see this, like, okay, this thing is being driven yeah. around by it. But that was covered <laughs> up by the greatest line in the movie. <laughs> you gotta be fucking kidding me! <laughs> right. like, we'll take a so, remote control car. So this is that. this is we're gonna keep we're gonna keep having this yeah. this issue, and, and maybe uh, next time I see it, I will uh, recognize it mm -hmm. as, uh, and I'll just bring my back, back myself back to, you know, what Richard said. You know, just take the movie, buy it on For VHS, it and you know, look it, it on a twenty-one inch, <laughs> and see how I like it then. But see, exactly. I chose this movie not for the effects. This movie is really? it's a tragedy, which you like. I do. It's a, love it's, a, a it's a love story encapsulated in a science fiction horror film. Mm -hmm. I love the acting in this movie. I think Jeff Goldblum gives a good, if not great, performance in this movie. If you compare him to Nicolas Cage, he's so cagey. Uh, but <laughs> Nicolas Cage, <laughs> I, I'm, what I'm going to do as an actor, mm -hmm. oh, I can, no. I could sit here for two hours and tell you the shit that he was doing in this movie that is not Nicolas Cage. Please don't. But I won't. <laughs> <laughs> but he's doing a lot of lot of character uh choices as Stuff, they would call yeah. it and Nicolas cage doesn't make character choices he just either screams or doesn't scream and <laughs> that's it gets, the, yeah. the stuff he's doing in this movie is is good acting uh it's a good character it's a great it's a great story and yes the effects are great up until the the time it comes out is the full fly even the bodysuit and the the metamorphosis and the body parts falling off and you know the first time she sees him mm -hmm. when he's got the walkers like all the body stuff he's doing the ticking and mm -hmm. the, like yep. all that stuff is great but then once yep. they get to the very where she rips his, the moment she rips his jaw off that's when it becomes a Cronenberg uh body an extravaganza <laughs> extravaganza yes yeah. uh but before that it's an actor's movie it's it's a lot of really subtle acting stuff going on even, well, even quite, the it, asshole boss right yeah um whose name sounds like it should be uh like an anagram of something funny but it isn't yeah it's just a bizarre name they picked for him but <laughs> it is quite a slow start to a film in a way it's kind of like it builds up very slowly with a you know sort of a love story with a little bit of sci-fi thrown in and a commodore 64 powering these two 
Geiger-esque pods that he's got. But mm. it's actually like 50 minutes before anything like really sort of, well, I suppose you've got some bits that happen. But generally, there's a big build up here. That's all I'm yeah. saying. Mm -hmm. I like how back to the future-y it is with the beta camcorder and the flashing right. of lights to do the teleport. I mean, it's it's like... A grim nightmare version of Back to the Future with a dude that turns into a fly. Mm. Very I like the way they handled it. How, how they handled it more like a uh, a a person with cancer and yes. watching them wither away, as opposed to like just a man in a fly head. Like they, I, yeah, I he really didn't, he didn't come out of the second pod half as a fly, fly, right? Yeah, which was which was cool. Yeah, because your body is going to fight itself. The cells are going to mutate, and everything's going to go wonky. Right. And just it's not going to happen right away. Just ask any scientist. They'll tell right. you that's well, what happened. But that scene, is... like when he's throwing sugar in his coffee, it's like that, yeah, that's, yeah. That, that's a lot of improv going on in there when he's doing the sugar in the coffee yeah, and yeah. he's banging the table. Like They totally do the quick change uh, personality-wise, but not physically. So sure. So you know the difference. Yes. Yeah. Did we all get there turned was... into flies in the nineties? Is that why we all got fat? No comment. No. <laughs> hey, I, got, so I got married. That's this what happened to is me. Uh, <laughs> don't blame your wife for that. Uh, no, she is. She's cooks very good though. <laughs> <laughs> Just bowls of sugar for everybody. Hey, yes, so uh, confession time, guys. I had never actually seen this movie before. This is my first what? watch too. Wow. And so really. Yeah, I you know wow. I've seen the Simpsons version a million times. <laughs> uh, I kind of like. So it is this better. where you hate on it as well? well? I don't hate on it. I just you know okay. the Simpsons did the same story in seven minutes, and I was fine. So uh, the thing about <laughs> the actual movie, the and I like the original The Fly a lot too. I I'm just conflicted. But mm -hmm. the thing that I I was watching this movie for the first time yesterday, and I just keep coming back to like. Are we sure that he actually mixed with like a male fly? You know, like what other weird DNA stuff is going to happen? Because I don't know anything about flies. Well, then he suddenly has a super dick for I don't know why reasons. And he just can't stop banging Gina Davis, which, you know. Yeah, but I think that was more. I don't think it has to do with a super dick. I just think it has to do with flies are uh, only alive for 24 hours. So they basically are born bang eat then die like that's what they do i don't know he did they, he, they did a lot of banging it was weird it was weird yeah. for me to have a lot of banging from malcolm from jurassic park and the lady from beetlejuice <laughs> uh lady but, from beetlejuice. so the thing is though uh -huh. so while i'm watching this happen and i'm just like kind of floored by how much banging these fly people are doing i notice his face is starting to get a little philadelphia and i go oh, oh no oh he's gonna oh no AIDS. we're doing aids we're doing AIDS with a fly. <laughs> and as they start doing the thing where it's like, oh, I need, uh, you know, I need help. And I don't know if I could transmit it. And I don't know if there's any, isn't there anything you can do? And I just think, oh my God, are they doing AIDS? So I Googled it in the middle of the movie, just the fly AIDS. And all these articles come up with Cronenberg talking about how, yeah, we were discussing the AIDS crisis. I was just like, oh, wow. Wow. But again, we're doing that AIDS. was... That was really scary to children of the yeah. 80s. Oh, yeah, as you it know? should be. But, like, uh, the fly bit was... is just, I mean, to do, like, you know, Videodrome and Shivers level Cronenberg effects about AIDS, just, right. it hit me in a way that I was just like, I don't, that might be more crass than Nightmare on Elm Street 2. But to be fair, this movie was being made before Cronenberg got involved and rewrote the script. So if that was Cronenberg's uh, idea and addition, this movie was going through pre-production, had a director and everything. Right, right. Uh, and that director's son or daughter was killed and he left the project. And then Cronenberg got dropped from Total Recall because he was making Total Recall. Uh, he lost, th he what? left that job and that would have been this interesting. Job. So uh, he came in and he said, I want this amount of money, but I want to, I want to rewrite and I want to direct. And they said, okay. So he might have, and according to your article search, took this already fleshed out idea and script and maybe, I don't know, added that stuff tweaked and it. or tweaked it to yeah. resemble that. But that was not the original reason why they remade the movie. I just think but, it's super interesting because it gave me like yeah. this... Uh, this synergy moment where Meet the Feebles 
suddenly like mm. parodied this movie in so many more ways than I originally originally understood. And guys, we need Meet the Feebles on Blu-ray. Have we talked mm. about this enough? Do we Peter Jackson put down the Lord of the Rings stuff? Get me Meet the Feebles in 4K. <laughs> I need it. I mean, do you really need I it? Do in just 4K? so I can hear the song "Sodomy" in 5.1. No, <laughs> uh, but I I, think... I'm okay. Go ahead. Yeah. No, no, I, I, I think I have heard it in 5.1, but probably not, not, <laughs> not native. <laughs> I'm just curious as to why it's crass. Like to me, if something's happening at the time, like this movie was written right eight, 84, 85, and they want to creatively bring awareness to something that everybody's dealing with and everybody's kind of uh, affected but by. Here's I, my question. Is, is, is Are they bringing it out to deal with it or is it just part of the kind of artistic culture, right? yeah, culture much like all of the 50s sci-fi films were all about Russians but they were actually aliens, right. you know? Is it just that's what the paranoia was? And I'm guessing... Uh, Cronenberg hung around in some pretty extreme circles of people and is is he just reflecting it naturally or is he really trying to make that point deliberately do you think? Could it be that it's, I want to say could it be cheap because it is what is what everyone is already afraid of? Does that I don't think really... he anybody be afraid of it. I just think he used it as a, an inspiration for everyone to feel for this character because i know for a okay. fact cronenberg said to dina davis because i saw an interview of hers and she said when she was trying to get her quote-unquote motivation mm -hmm. with the scenes he explained to her he said don't look at him as as a as a man turning into a fly look at him as a loved one who has cancer and is deteriorating in front of your eyes like he didn't say has aids didn't say right. you know uh, you can't touch him. Like he just kind of put that motivation in her mind to be able to sense memory because a lot of actors need that sense memory to get right. there. And that's good sense memory because most of us have had at least one or two people in our life that have died in front of us or died mm -hmm. withered away and we watched them die, whatever. Yep. It's a, it's a good motivation whether I don't ever see that as crass to be motivated by real life things. Cause as, yeah. as an actor, that's something that you do. You, you, Sure. Touch on your own life. Yeah, no, I'm just I'm just trying to maybe <clears throat> make sense of it in my own mind. Uh why why Dan would think it's crass. And I'm thinking maybe, you know, maybe it's cuz he feels like it's kind of like a cheap thing to tap into people's fears. Yeah, tap into people's fears but I don't think what they're the already intent. afraid of. It's like yeah, it's it's almost like but then again, I don't I don't kind of I don't think that that could be either because I mean, we just watched uh, you know, a couple of months ago two movies about nuclear war and <clears throat> and that was what was relevant at the time and what everyone was afraid of and this was you know uh, a couple months ago right <laughs> yeah i mean this was a couple <laughs> months ago we watched this and, and and it's like no the movies have to reflect like yes. art reflects life or maybe the vice, vice versa but like it has to be to be interesting to you know to kind of relate to people um i don't know I don't I, think it cheapens it, even if that is the case. Which I, I don't either. Be, I, I don't either. No, I don't yeah. either. Now that I'm thinking about it, because I think it was delicately handled. It wasn't preachy. It wasn't like we can't, we can't touch. They can't touch each other. Right. She grabs him. She hugs him when he's when he just puked on a donut. Yeah, I was gonna say the delicately handled part when his ear falls off and he goes, "Oh, <laughs> my ear," <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah. I just, it's. Uh, I, you know, I've only been sitting with this for 24 hours. I just I haven't had time to yeah. piece through it, but like. There's an exploitational element to it that I just didn't expect to be there versus something right. like The Thing, the original one, or Them, where it's like we have this universal fear of war with an external power, but we can't deal with the fact that we look at a movie of us fighting the Soviets. So let's, you know, pick a proxy for the Soviets, and this time it's giant bugs or whatever. In this case, it's like mm. we have this horrible crisis that only about you know, uh, half or less of the countries actually that invested in in 86. And so let's make a movie that's taking some of these fundamental fears that we're feeling, but like not actually address it enough that most people will probably even catch on to the fact that it's about this thing it's about. And also his ears going to fall off and his jaws going to get ripped off. So I don't know. Yeah. It, you know, we can have this conversation again this fall when we talk about a particular movie uh, that 
I don't even know if you guys have, well, you haven't seen it yet, George. I don't know if Travis has caught on to its slightly exploitational elements uh, as to whether or not it's crass or successful. Actually, that could be a new segment. Crass or successful. <laughs> crass, <laughs> crass or successful. I, I think I chalk it. It's kind of like Cronenberg is kind of like Creighton, where he writes what he knows. And, and All right, he... Michael Crichton, not Crichton, yeah. the robot from Red Dwarf. Fine. <laughs> right. Yeah. Michael Crichton, who, you know, has a scientific mind, and, and Cronenberg's known for doing scientific horror where it's 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 in your face and it's based on reality even though it's science fiction it you're looking at it you're like okay that if it's gonna happen that could happen that way you know that they, they i don't know that i've ever had for... that thought watching a cronenberg movie no to be fair he's it, meaning he likes to not cheapen it by not showing like he if he's going to show somebody disemboweled he's going to make sure those intestines look like it's someone's real intestines are coming out like he's not going to say yeah. oh just get some sausage you know, he's going to make sure it looks and legit. Honestly, we're spoiled now, and uh, I don't know every film that George has seen. I could probably find out 90% of it. But, you know, you look at the special effects of films like uh, the Saw series and kind of like the, the modern horror films, mm -hmm. and then you've got to realise that back in the sort of 70s and 80s, it was just like a load of kensington gore red paint thrown around mm -hmm. some kind of really bad looking intestines and, and that was it so this is showing a, a real shift cronenberg really as you say it, it was detailed everything mm -hmm. he did i mean i remember again going back to scanners the head exploding scene sorry yep. i've just ruined that film uh <laughs> And I remember George like, has seen Wayne's it. World, so he he already knew about that. Okay, he knows. <laughs> pausing it on VHS sure. multiple times yes. to watch how they did the special effects, and like I can still remember the frames of like at this point it flaps open here, here, and here, and it was just it was you know beyond anything we'd seen at that point. There, there were other people doing it, and notably we mentioned him. Obviously, Clive Barker was uh, was quite well known for that sort of mm. stuff with with hellraiser but yeah I, I i think cronenberg was like like you look forward to a cronenberg horror or sci-fi i guess uh it, it, he is a a very sort of special talent and and mm. does things in his own way uh you and, know what you're getting yeah you know what you're getting mm -hmm. and he never disappoints and uh we, we've mentioned the jaw scene in this that really disturbed me as a kid. I don't know why. There's something about Jaws. Like, uh, it just disturbed the hell out of me. Because the human head looks ridiculous without its front bottom. Yeah. Without its mandible. It, it, it's like, it really that, does, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was horrible back then. And also, all of the vomity stuff that he does. Mm. He does it so well. I mean, yeah, it doesn't bear up to modern effects. But in the day, it looked so, so good. And we haven't even talked about the poor baboon yet. I mean, we haven't even heard oh, any yeah. of George's notes, so I, I guess I'll wait to, for him to get the there. Poor that baboon. poor, that poor baboon. Ah, <laughs> oh, jeez. Who apparently had a had a liking towards one of the women on the crew, and he had an erection half the time. <laughs> I watched the documentary. They're talking about this monkey's erection the whole time. They're like, "Yeah, we had to make sure we weren't shooting it because he kept." He had the thing for blondes, they said. There was this one assistant director that was, every time she was on set, he was like, bang. Well, you know, they like, accidentally mixed God. his DNA with that of a fly. He couldn't help it. It was just all the time. That's true. I come well, here for the acting tips. I stay here for the <laughs> Simeon Boner references. <laughs> hey, you figured us out. Can we quote that? Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> just do a uh, 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 an Apple uh, podcast review for us. <laughs> and, uh, just the it, best like that primate verbatim. boner <laughs> podcast <laughs> on the internet. Yeah, <laughs> nobody oh, discussed shit. baboon wood like these guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I'm printing that. I'm putting that on the shirt. That's a t-shirt <laughs> and a mug. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> fantastic <laughs> no yeah um inside out baboon uh, i two thumbs up yeah see i'm chasing that uh that blue pill sponsorship that joe rogan has right <laughs> so <we're talking laughs> about right. monkey boners and do you boobies. want a <laughs> do you, you want, want a boner like the baboon like that baboon <laughs> from that movie jeff goldblum wow. spanish fly pills that's what we need <laughs> yeah that inside out baboon always bothered me 
Yeah, I kind was of... not happy with that as a child, yeah. well, as a young adult, as a young teenager. But I was like, ugh. And, and again, it's Cronenberg. So mm. you can't really see what it is. You're like, eh, there's a like sort of sausagey mass there, but I'm not sure what I'm looking at. Oh, is that a bit of an eyeball? Yes, that is a bit of an eyeball. And it's horrible. You're like, ah, oh, this is this is not nice. This is not good. Yeah, that very much reminded me of uh, some of the effects in The Thing. Hmm. And I I also, th- when when I saw it with my eyes, I thought, well, I was warned about this, hmm. right? You know, yep. at, uh, you know at, uh, when they were eating and just like, what happens when you try to, you know, Tran, you know, transport something that's alive, and he's like, uh, <laughs> it's maybe, maybe when you're done eating, like, yeah. you know, or whatever he says. But uh, when it actually happened, I was like, yeah, that's about what I thought. It, it looks would like look when you like. put your lasagna in for a minute too long. <laughs> oh, it was it was bad, man. And it's especially because like it was, I guess, especially because it was still like moving and suffering, kind of. Yeah. Oof. Yeah, it it was worse back then. There were actually, I you know I didn't like really ca- I think. I don't know. I I just I don't think I really cared for uh, Goldblum that much, but um, you know the the effects were great and the and the like the and the story was great and I really there's a lot of stuff in here that I'm like super excited to talk about, and and one of them was it, it, there's there's a lot of scenes where you like you said earlier, um, it you think he's gonna cut away mm-hmm. but he doesn't, um, like for instance. Uh, the scene that comes to my mind, which was very extremely uncomfortable to watch, probably the most uncomfortable to watch, was the dream sequence. Spoiler oh, alert: yeah. it was a dream. But the that, larvae the, scene, as that, they call it, yeah. Oh my god, yeah. was Classic so un- Cronenberg, though, so right? uncomfortable to watch, and that was the point. Of mm-hmm. uh, geez, Louise, hats off. Yeah, I. It did what it was supposed to do. See, I thought you were going to say the, the most uncomfortable scene was watching uh, what's his face with the beard. Uh, what's his name? Stathis Baranus or something. <laughs> Sick Ch- <laughs> Chasing. Uh, isn't he a character in Game of Thrones? Is it Stannis yeah. Baratheon? That, that's his <laughs> name. Anyway, he was chasing Gina Davis in a really disgusting beige Saab, I think, yeah. in a really nice 80s Maserati. Now, that. That was a scene that that disgusted and, and appalled me. I was like, everything's wrong with these cars. Who buys a beige Saab? If you're a successful photographer, you don't buy that car. But um, yeah, uh, it, 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 it it's a hideous film in so many ways. That's why I love it. Um, the, when I was a kid, the one that disturbed me the most was, A, not the first time he throws up on the guy, not the second time he throws up on him, but when he starts to go up towards his head with a smile on his face, yes, yes that's when I'm yes. like, that's effed up. Yeah. And when he hits his teeth with his pencil and they fall on the keyboard. Oh, yeah. when tooth, horror. I was a tooth kid, horror is next to eye horror is the worst thing to see. <laughs> <laughs> I was, every time my teeth felt loose, I'm like, oh my God, that's going to happen to me. <laughs> like that was so, cause then he does like this, this, oh, okay, this is happening kind of face. I think like, the, the the shock though one for me was the arm wrestling scene, and I think I mentioned it earlier off air. But yes, when that happened, that was the first kind of uh, things are about to get really fucked up here. There's yeah. no doubt about it. This is this is different gravy now. See and that bothered is, me, but vomit. him leaving the bar with the ugliest woman in the bar was probably worse than the arm break. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I would have left with one of those guys first. I think. I don't know. Oof! Just oof. <laughs> she looked like trash. <laughs> she, yeah. What's uh, the guy's name she from was Home Alone? To. What's the actual line? Is it Butch or like a, what? Oh, Buzz. Like, Buzz. Buzz. Buzz, Buzz yeah. Like, Buzz, Buzz, your girlfriend. Woof. Woof. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's become a quote in my house. <laughs> <laughs> my kids always do that. Buzz's girlfriend. Woof. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> uh, that was such a funny film. Can we talk about that? I I need I need less vomit and more Kevin McAllister in my life. Oh man. But yeah, that 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 dream sequence yeah, to me solidified Gina, cuz Gina Davis was a she was a, a, a like a lingerie model. I think she was like a Victoria's Secret model like a long time ago or a Sears catalog model. To to go to that level, I know she did a couple movies before that, but I think she was like in Tootsie. She played a small part in that, so 
she was not, I didn't know she had that kind of range. And she definitely shows it. I mean, she's crying probably 85% of that movie. Yeah. Again, as a as a showreel for Jeff Goldblum and Gina Davis, both this is this is a one stuff. This film, yes, they are at their peak in in not just like sexual chemistry that they've got, but just their acting is just brilliant in it. It's just for its time, it was it was gritty and real when everyone else was just a bit too glossy and and Hollywood, you know. So I, I got agree. a question: what yes. what year does uh like Aliens eighty six? And this this movie was what eighty five, eighty six, no eighty seven, same year, same year. Okay, because that yeah, because that was kind of another. It it's what it reminded me of, right? The alien popping out of the yes. chest. Yes, that dream sequence that Sigourney Weaver has is almost exactly the same. Yeah, dream sequence. Yeah, that's yeah. the feeling that I got, and also kind of crossed with uh, uh, what's that Italian movie that you showed me, Dan? What have they done to Solange? I think. Oh yeah. Yeah, it was that. It was aliens crossed with that, and it just made for a just a brutal, uncomfortable. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I think it's was... interesting because I again hadn't seen this movie till yesterday, but I've seen enough Cronenberg to know that like worm vagina interplay is kind of his wheelhouse, which made me <laughs> right. less surprised. It's a very specific Cronenberg wheelhouse. When that larvae thing <laughs> popped out of the lady uh, out of Gina, Gina Davis's uh, dream self uh i i didn't go ew i went oh we're doing shivers again okay like yeah. eh. no. well george is like, gonna feel that i don't have that background yeah. so there was I one at the end around. uh at the very end when you have like the final form of this fly mixed with other things uh it was videodrome but the other end of it yeah. and i was just like oh we're mm. doing videodrome but the back end like Okay, like Cronenberg's got things, and now we're doing but, like the greatest hits I, of Cronenberg already. But see, I I always felt that that's what Cronenberg was doing all along, and ended at the film Existens. I think that's how you say it, um, because it seemed like he was pushing the body horror further and further until he got to that ultimate film that was all about organic like body guns and alien horror crap. And I was like, mm. that's it. You've now reached. Like you can, then then I think he came out with Crash after that, and it was like, yeah, no, yeah. no one wants to see. So that, what you're so. saying is he peaked. He peaked. He, but he peaked. It almost yeah. sounds like Dan is is scolding Cronenberg for the very thing that we praised his, Michael Crichton his for his lack of originality. Like, well, no, Michael Crichton formula? did Westworld, and then he got a second chance to make Westworld and put dinosaurs in it. Uh huh. So it's like, uh huh, Dan. Now you're on the ten hot years seat. later, he perfected his craft and made jurassic park from the skeleton of westworld it's true yeah the video drums 83 so it's like it'd be like if you you released a good record and then three years later you released a record with the same song structure but like all the songs were slightly different yeah but it's it's almost like the kevin it's the kevin smith argument like uh, kevin smith makes clerks on his own dime independent right doesn't have any thing to lose and makes clerks then, ten years later, he's got uh, quadrupled the budget, uh, studio backing, uh, huge uh, stars in his movies. But he's still making the same movie. He just has more money, bigger stars, and uh, more time. So it's like, and he, yeah. So is that good? Yeah, I was gonna say. Are we saying better? that David no, Cronenberg, Cronenberg is the same level took... as Kevin Smith? Because I could get on that argument. No, I'm saying like Cronenberg took the opportunity. He's got this movie that's already an established IP. Uh, he's got uh, Mel Brooks uh, film company backing him. He's got 20th Century Fox money. So he's so he's saying this thing that I did that didn't do very well. I'm gonna do it again. It's gonna work this time. Well, I'm, well, it did work. This movie was uh, well, no. I'm not saying it did or it didn't. I'm just saying that's what his mindset. The people that see The Fly are not seeing. Slip uh, a shimmer. Right, that's what I'm They're saying. not seeing, uh, you know, uh, what was the other one you said? Uh, Video Videodrome, Drome. which honestly, They're not to not have it. to watch Video Drome again because I don't like James Woods would be like helpful. <laughs> right. So, but the people that you're getting a better audience with the fly, you're getting guys bringing their girlfriends, you're getting, sure. you know, teenage people that you wouldn't get to go yeah, see. Yeah, I'm not Videodrome. saying that it's good or bad or whatever. I'm just saying so he, had thinking, a, he had a chance to like put this thing right. that's in his head in a more popular movie that yes. maybe more people will see. With more money. And maybe and it will be, like, people will get it now. Right. Like, you know, because more people will see it. Because it. it's I his, it, every, every composer has their 
tricks sure. and their music and whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He every filmmaker has the same thing. So uh, again, it wouldn't bother me so much. Like I I I wasn't a Cronenberg fan enough to go, oh well, that's from that's from that movie and that's from that movie. Like I watched this movie when when it came out, I had no idea who Cronenberg was. So I saw this movie before I saw any of his other movies. You and me both. So I didn't sit watching The Fly going, oh, I saw that already. Oh, there's a larvae dick. There's a dick baby. Like and I, I probably, I, I was going to say, I probably saw all of these around about the same time, probably around like 91-ish, uh, again, when I was like 15, 16. That's when right. I peaked with my Cronenberg. I'd seen Scanners, Videodrome, Dead, Com- uh, Dead Zone. Um, right. What else did he do? Uh, Dead Ringers uh, and Dead The Ringers, Fly. Yeah. and. And I remember like the the hoo ha about naked lunch coming out, and oh, mm-hmm. it's an uh, you know I was like this this is just Cronenberg doing his body horror shit again. I, I I'm kind of there for it, and like I say, Existence, which was ninety nine, uh, I think uh, that was it. That was like oh, I'm kind of bored of this now, uh, right. but I don't have a problem with it. I kind of love that he is the mad guy who does the worm uh, orifice horror. <laughs> <laughs> what's funny is i i only knew him from his acting yeah what i mean i saw this movie but i wasn't thinking directors back then i was like 15 16 it was like yeah. 1987 1988 but i knew him from um he was in nightbreed so played, yeah i knew him from night he was great right. in nightbreed as well nightbreed, right yeah and then he was in jason 10 later on and i'm like oh that's Cronenberg. That's the guy who directed The Fly. Like, I knew him then, but it was like, right. even years had gone by, I didn't put the two together. But I knew him from Nightbreed, and I knew him from, as an actor, not a director. So, again, this movie didn't sit there and go, oh, well, we already did this. I don't know if it's as much already did this. It's more like, oh, we're doing that again. Right. Without Lynn Lowry this don't... time, which honestly, <laughs> if you could have had Lynn Lowry, I would have been more on board with this movie. I've never even seen Scanners. You've never seen Scanners? I've seen enough of it to not... I never went to see it because I had seen all the the big parts in it. Well, you've seen Deep Red, which is basically it. what it's trying to do. So Okay. But the thing about Scanners is, as I say, it's got uh, Patrick McGowan, who played the prisoner in uh, a British TV show. Probably, I would still say, the best TV show of all time. Like, beats every modern tv show into a cocked hat uh, and mm. patrick mcgowan is just such a brilliant character actor he he is just excellent and he's kind of at the end of his career in this film pretty much he's kind of retired to hollywood and doing bit parts on colombo at this point so right. to come out and and do this and give it the same gravitas was was i just loved it all the other actors i guess michael ironside being the the um the most exception, known. Yeah, yeah, the others were all kind of like they just disappeared into nothing. They're just like, like 80s VHS movie actors. But the film just has a, I don't know, it's like all Cronenberg films are a little bit unhinged in their own way. They don't they don't roll together like you expect a Hollywood film to. And I think that adds to them. I think that really does give them a slightly more horrific quality. It's not the kind of normal running order that you expect in a horror film. Uh, right. So, yeah, and, and The Fly is probably one of his finest examples of it in, in my humble opinion. And growing up, like there were two remakes that ever were <laughs> accepted as better than the original, even though you look at like this and the thing are the two remakes where people are like, Oh my god. It's mm-hmm. you know, it's it's leaps and bounds. But when people that are purists and they, they still love the originals, but they take the remakes for what they are. And for me, The Fly was always one of those Saturday morning things that I sat with my dad after watching Mighty Joe Young. We'd watch, you know, The Fly or whatever. And it was just one of those background movies. But when this came out, it was like, it's a remake, but it's not. It's like a totally different movie. It's one of the first kind of, like, glossy reboots that I can think of, actually. Yeah. Kind of like, it's the same world, if you like, the same general premise, but it's completely different. Um. But yeah, uh, more vomit, more, <laughs> more horrendous I, stuff. I think the body part stuff is great. It, the, and if you notice when he's when he's opening that medicine cabinet, his his uh his willy's ha- sitting on one of those shelves. <laughs> yeah, well, I was looking for it. You know, like, oh, I did yeah. not notice if, that. If yeah. you weren't if you weren't looking for that, 
You're not paying attention. Yeah. Oh, He's got dude, teeth and fingernails and ears and that. then yeah, his willies in there. So it's uh, like kudos, <laughs> kudos. That's that's some detail that didn't need to happen. But yeah, uh, that's that's. I don't, uh, I don't I don't know whether I should go back sick. and look for that bit or not. I don't know what. And that what's makes funny me. as I was explaining that because I was watching a little bit with my 13 year old son, and I was like, this is kind of like if you take a superhero movie, but you make it. If it were really going to happen, yeah, if you are exposed to radiation, you're not going to become the Hulk. You're going to become this bubbling mess that this guy has become. Right. You know, they touch on this it a little bit in X-Men. Spider-Man should have Should have happened, right, yeah. <laughs> like, when you watch X-Men, they kind of touch on how a human is affected and mutated when they're not naturally mutated. They show yeah. you what happens to people when they're forced to mutate. Right. And that's what this shows you it's like this guy don't they just explode into a puddle of water yeah it's I, basically what happens to the, I, uh, the senator correctly. kelly yeah, yeah he his body rejects it and then he basically becomes a pile of mess yeah this is the same thing like it, the whole movie is his body fighting the mutation and because that's all it is it's radiation mutation and his cells splicing together and it, it's it's kind of realistic like this is what a superhero mov- movie would look like if he Went on the rooftop. If he ever made it to be an actual 185 pound fly, right? He would have been. He might have been a superhero. Fly. A superhero fly. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> now that's some right? insight. <laughs> I'm just trying to think of the costume, though. I mean, it, it, w- would he have needed to wear underpants on the outside like Superman? He wouldn't have needed a cape because he'd have wings like a fly. Well, he wouldn't need right? the underpants because his dick's in the closet. <laughs> that's true. It's a very, it's a very good. Well, maybe that's why he needs the underpants. Right. That's Oof. true. Yeah. Woofa. Woof. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we call him Superfly. You wear, you know, big. That's a great idea for shoes. a film. We yeah. should definitely come out with a film called <laughs> Superfly. <laughs> I'll make it after I make butt work. <laughs> butt work. Butt work. Does Richard even? Does Richard even know? No. no. Well, I'm not going to bore Richard with that story, but I'll give you a little story. Uh, we we got a cameo from uh, Dan. Got a cameo from Kevin Smith. Because when we were doing Clerks, I said that I didn't say I hated the movie and I wanted to remake it. I basically said when we were talking about the acting and Dan's excuse was, well, they're theater people and they're they're not really going to be that good. And I said, well, I had no six people I could get together to make this movie. Theater people. Through theater. That are. That would kill it. And he's like, oh, so you want to remake Clerks? I'm like, no, I just I think I could probably get these actors a better performance. So then Dan (laughs) took it upon himself (laughs) to. To go to Kevin Smith and say, my co-host wants to remake, to remake Clerks. Clerks. He thinks he can do a better job. What do you think of that? So Kevin Smith sends us a nine-minute cameo nice. in Kevin, Kevin Smith form <laughs> where he basically boasts that his movie's in the uh, National Archives Museum and, and uh, he's obviously a good director because he has a pop made of I've, him. I've watched and it a hundred times. I've watched times. it many times and he rips oh. on me constantly and it's the best thing that ever happened to me. <laughs> uh, that's pretty cool. I mean, not not to become all Kevin Smith fanboy. I I used to, uh, Clark's was massive for me in in right. uh, again early nineties. I guess when that first came out, and it was a you know tape that would pass around. It's like this is so funny. You've got to watch this. Yes, it was uh, one of those VHS and, grabs. Y- yeah, and I have a. I think I've got a signed copy of the Clark's animated series, mm. possibly, and uh, also the script for Chasing Amy. Because before he was like super famous, he was like right. selling all his merch. I was like, I'm buying it all. Uh, yeah. And and Dogma was a fantastic. I've still got, uh, I've still got a, one of the original Dogma. Uh, I forget what they're called. The Jesus guy in it. Um, you know the winking, pointing yes. Jesus figure. Mm-hmm. I have one of those. But then it all just got a bit samey for me with Kevin yes. Smith. It all yeah. just got tiresome, and none of the like sequels like did anything. Yes, I very much enjoyed seeing Mark Hamill as the cock knocker. That was funny, yeah. but <laughs> other than that, like the rest of it, uh, kind of left me really cold. And Clark yeah. too. Honestly, I can't even remember what happened in it. It was just, yeah, right. just dumb. well. The reason why we we always talk about Travis's remake butt work. Is yeah, he because <laughs> it came around. Well, go ahead. You, you. He he basically was like saying to me, you know, yeah, you can remake Clerks. I remade, and he said a movie that he basically based his Clerks on, and he was like, you know, you just got to be able to, you know, talk about your job or figure out this and that. And he goes through this whole spiel, and he goes, you know, you can make a movie and do 
do make a movie about doing anything but work. There you go. You can call <laughs> it you can call it butt work. <laughs> <laughs> and and I was like, so now whenever we bring it up, I was like, oh, we're still yeah. trying to... And we haven't brought it up in a while, so even for the benefit of the listeners, like we yes. talk about butt work. They might not even know what they it is. It was a it very means. early episode. It's a great so... callback, though. Yeah, so, we did Clerks yeah. like s- season one, episode like four. It's good to I put think. it out there. You know, What yeah. are we talking about when we talk about butt work? Yes, butt work. That's what it so is. So then my goal is to become big enough to where we bring Kevin Smith on, and then we discuss. And we make butt work. And we make butt work. Yeah. <laughs> and what's funny is he's doing a film, uh, I think, film festival right now out of North Jersey, and he's taking submissions. I was like, oh, man, if I had just completed butt work, I would have submitted it. <laughs> How are you spelling butt work, though? Let me just, just confirm. It isn't two T's, <laughs> is it? I, 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 w- the way he said it, he meant it as one T. <laughs> but the insult, the insult was meant with two T's, I think. <laughs> I, I, I think that film already exists. Uh, yeah, I'm sure. And I don't want to put it out. Specialist on TV. video uh, collections. <laughs> There's a lot of people that own butt work, but it's not the movie I want to make. <laughs> right. Uh, I don't oh, think I can man. top that. No, that's amazing. Um, <laughs> what's it just sucked that we had fly? to pay. <laughs> We had to pay for that that berating. I wish I wish he had heard it <laughs> well, and sent me a. Well, we didn't. They ended. I I mean, look, let, uh, cameo is a really interesting thing, though, isn't it? It's like microtransactions, depending on how famous they are, mm-hmm. uh, and they can be both the most like beautiful gifts and the most depressing things in the world. Like, uh, I don't know whether I mentioned this one before, but I got my daughter one from uh, one of the guys from the In Betweeners. And, mm. uh, you know, the in-betweeners is massive over here. She right. loved it. It was hilarious. And he's absolutely killing it on that platform. And then you just think, some of these people, though, like, are probably, this is their one source of income now. Yep. yep. And uh, also, I hate all celebrity. Um, <laughs> I, I only do comedians because that's fun. But, yeah, it's a weird, it's a weird, and there's like 15 different cameo rip-offs now. Um, yeah. so it's a really weird market, definitely. But um... it's it's definitely good for when you're stuck on a GIF, though. <laughs> <laughs> one of one of the more sad uh, cameos was when uh, was when Dan uh, interviewed uh, Carpenter. <laughs> but that wasn't a cameo. <laughs> that was not a cameo. That's cruel. I saw that. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, well, gotta go. Yep. See ya. Time's up, bro. Peace See out. See a weird horror boy with your <laughs> fancy questions that you thought about. <laughs> I'm only here to talk about the music I've written and nothing else. Oh, man. I was like, but so it is sad. weird. I, it, like, I kind of have this, like, if I go to a gig and let's say it's something to do with Wampler and therefore I go and meet like the guitarist or whatever. And there's a bit of me that always thinks, oh, wouldn't it be cool to go and meet the whole band? And then there's a bit of me that goes, no, because no. you're not going to become their friends straight away. Right. So you're just going to be another annoying fan, even if you work in the industry. And I think it's the same with these like cameo things. You think this is going to be amazing. I'm, and then he's like, who is this absolute anus who wishes for me to wish <laughs> happy birthday to him? Right. Oh, yes, I'll say the line. Okay. Say the line. <laughs> this anus. <laughs> I do have to say, I watched an interview with Kevin Conroy on who is YouTube. He? He's the voice of the uh, animated Batman. So he's been oh, doing yeah, it for yeah. like 30 years. He's like, he's the Batman. <laughs> and uh, he was being interviewed and he's talking about, uh, the, the, they bring up Cameo. And he seems so genuine that there are probably a few people out there that really enjoy the fact that they are able to talk about things with fans. I hope Where, so. As long as they're not doing like happy birthdays and this and that. But like to actually really talk about what they're doing yeah. and have an interested person on the other side. They have to really probably enjoy that. Yeah, well, I got that feeling when I was watching Savini, and oh yeah, he show, took us on a full tour. Sh- show us, a, you know, had tickets for a tour of his yeah. workshop or whatever. Um, you could tell like he wasn't uninterested or right. bored by it. Did you see that one, Rich? I Richard? didn't actually. Uh, you, uh, I'm gonna check it out after this. Yeah, the, Savini again. Dan breaks my balls about because I. <laughs> Even though I am the hugest Savini fan, one of the hugest, uh, I ripped on the effects of Dawn of the Dead. And that's where my 3M comment came right, from the 3M, earlier. Three M blood and how okay. bad it looked. Okay, so then, yeah. because he, the blood in in uh, uh, what movie was it? It was uh, 
Dawn of the Dead? Dawn, yeah. Yeah, it was Dawn of the Dead. The blood Dawn of the like... Dead, that is uh that is the supermarket mall one, right? Yes. 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 And yeah. the blood was really bad and really apparently bad. it was like a th- it was a a product that was made by 3M, the like the the fake blood the 3M fake blood of the time that they used. It was literally 3M blood and so you know, Dan sends him this thing and he's like I want you to mention that Travis was ripping on you blah blah blah. <laughs> so so Savini <laughs> Savini basically agrees with me and says yeah it was really shitty blood and then he said it didn't photograph it well. didn't photograph well so that's another com- comment we say yeah. but it looked great in the bottle gave a, it looked great in the <laughs> bottle but he gives instead of doing like the two minute blah 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 you know he doesn't want to be bothered you could tell he really he took us on a tour of his studio and he and he mentioned like all the effects and gave us a couple stories like it was a really good cameo it wasn't like one of those oh yeah yeah blah 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 happy birthday ball yeah, like he he enjoyed it, and it was great because it was in the room that and we I enjoyed it. I'd always wanted to visit <laughs> when yeah. I was a kid. I had a picture of that room in my room, so it was kind of neat to take that little tour. Wow, I kind matter. of imagine his house is exactly like. Did you ever see the film FX Murder by yes. Illusion? Yes. I kind of imagine his life to be exactly like the main character in that. It Just is like every corner is filled with a prop. He's got uh, a giant fluffy in his hallway, like, and he's like, "Oh, that's fluffy." And yeah. I'm like, yeah, I know who that is. <laughs> <laughs> George no, I'm a big fan. But... So if you could have a cameo <laughs> from uh, with someone from the uh, the fly, who would it be? It would be Stannis oh. Baratheon, surely. It would be <laughs> it would be the bearded weirdo, the bearded weirdo, the prick. Yeah, the <laughs> the renter prick. I really um, didn't like the bearded weirdo. He gave me the impression that even at the end of the movie, he was just like ten seconds away from being like, hey. How do you like my stump? <laughs> Run, Gina Davis. Yeah. Run. Yeah. It's a long I mean, his, his, his redemption was good. Like the fact that he he loved her and he fought to his death, basically to save yeah. her, was was nice. But then it it was kind of like that's the counterpoint to him just turning up in her shower. Like, yeah. what are you doing here? I still have the key. Like, what <laughs> and kind I don't of think loose woman are you, Gina? Right. Yeah, exactly. Who does you know that? Who... He reminded me of the Richard Mole character in Mr. Mom. Like, <laughs> I know George hasn't seen Mr. Mom. Have you seen Mr. Mom? I don't think so. All right, so Richard uh, Mole basically either. plays that same douchebag character. He's like the boss of Terry Gar, and he's moving in on, on her while Michael Keaton's a stay-at-home dad while she okay. works. So he's kind of that douchebag where he's like, oh, yeah, here's my hotel key. You know, go go unwind. Yeah, mm. you know, the, your douche meter has gone up. The moment he speaks. Hey, I uh, I I had a, a moment where I really felt for uh for the the douchebag with the beard, mm-hmm. and that was when she flushed the toilet. <laughs> oh, when he, he was, was in the while shower. he was in the shower. Yeah. Is there a plumbing system on Earth that doesn't do that? I don't know. Because I want that. Yeah, mine no. can't. Like when you flush the toilet, the water it doesn't change the temperature of the water in the shower. No, no. not in modern. Plumbing. Oh my! No. Oh my God! That must be an American thing. No, we, we yeah, have, we have that now. No, <laughs> in it's, our house. you guys. Dude, just, it's it's bad. you have old plumbing is what you have. They figured yeah. that out now. That's not a problem. Oh, yes, our, our hot water and our cold water come from different places. Oh, same with us. But whenever you flush the toilet or There's, turn the yeah, sink well, on in what the bathroom, happens the is shower it, it, water it changes. Kind of, uh, it kind of. Uh, it. I have a hundred year old house. I have though. to I have to think of it in like electrical terms. Um it makes the cold sag. Yeah. Right? When right, you flush the toilet, yeah. it makes the cold sag so and then the so water you, gets hotter. You need a you need a buffer. That's what you need. You need right. a, co- you need a, a cold, cold buffer. You need a cold buffer. Yeah, the buffer is, hey, I'm about to flush the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> so or t- <laughs> or oops, I just flushed the toilet. Yeah. Like jump out of the shower real quick. <laughs> That's actually not a bad trick at the right party. Anyways, uh, I felt for I felt for that guy. That's not comfortable. Hey, uh, speaking of guitar terms, Richard, you're from a guitar podcast, and George and I yes play guitar, and Travis knows what guitars are. Um, yeah, uh, and we and we listen too. When yeah. they oh, uh, when they scanned the steak, and then recreated it, and it tasted synthetic. Anybody else get a digital modeling kind of feel like? Oh yeah, you almost. <laughs> modeled that steak but we know in 10 oh years it's gonna sound like you know. yeah so that was what you're saying is that's kind of like the line six of steak is that what you're saying yeah the boss that was the pod the pod the, of oh, steak the, the pod of steak yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. the kemper of steaks hadn't been invented at that stage correct that's exactly yeah. what i was gonna say hmm. <laughs> well 
The computer just needed to be taught. That's right. Because well, that's how computers work. In yeah, they had to understand flesh. Yeah, they have to <laughs> teach them how to understand flesh, yeah. I hmm. thought that the uh, DNA splicing cure idea actually was probably the most scientifically viable uh, concept in the movie, although I felt like what, they didn't the implement it correctly. So, again, I think this is one of the things that The Fly is great for, is it was a gritty uh, sci-fi. It wasn't, mm -hmm. here's some lasers and spaceships, which right. we basically all wanted back in the 80s, clearly. Yeah. But this was like, here's actual scientific terms and technologies you may not have thought of, which, yeah, there were other films in that whole realm, but they were few and far between back like now, you turn on the sci-fi channel and you've got 50 of them. But yeah. then... It was kind of like Alien. Like, Alien yeah. was a space movie, but it was a haunted house, like, organic movie. It wasn't like Star Trek. It was like, uh, it was just happened to take place in space. But it was an organic exactly. horror movie. Yeah. Which so, I'll take. And, and that was, like, genre bending at the time. Um, you know, Alien was clearly the, the start of it, but... Mm -hmm. That was 79, so we're only talking a difference of seven years here, really. Uh, it was very much still an out-there thing to do, I think, to do yeah. something gritty, dirty. You know, again, you know, we all know how amazing Blade Runner looked compared to all the other sci-fi films. Yeah. This felt like the same sort of feel to me. It was like, like you look at the colouring, and I know colour grading back in the 80s wasn't quite the same as it is now, but everything was kind of gritty and dirty and beiges and greys. And it, it really works for the film. It, it just bored it all out. But again, the science fiction element was was spot on. It was, yes. you know, yes, okay, we can laugh at the, you know, Commodore 64 that runs his entire DNA splicing pod that looks <laughs> like, you know, something that Geiger rejected for Alien 2. But it, it, at the same time, it was way ahead of its time for what was coming out of Hollywood back then. And, sure. and the CGI on that computer was not bad for the time. Yeah, I'm like, guessing it was I'm guessing it was painted matte on though. Um yeah. looking at it, I was like, Yeah, there there isn't any aliasing around those letters. They've been no. painted by an artist. Yeah. That's the guy who did Return of the Jedi. He's just he's a ninja. He can just paint anything. It probably <laughs> isn't. It might be, well, I don't know. <clears throat> that's funny. What's funny is the the splicing you're talking about at the end, they cut out a scene that shows him working on that. As as a mutating fly man, he's putting a cat and a baboon in the different pods, and they splice them together, and there's like this footage of what they created. And I'm glad they cut it, but mm. <laughs> it's like pure 80s like puppeteering genius. Like the, To see this cat baboon <laughs> thing flipping around while he's trying to stab it. <laughs> Like, well, you know, and what's so funny is... I mean, now, that sounds horrific, though. Yeah, That yeah. does sound... Like, I'm thinking, I want that scene in. I I know it probably looks like... You can find uh, it. It's on the DVD. It's on what? the uh, deleted footage. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll look on YouTube now. I haven't you can probably find DVD it on the DVD player, yeah. Yep. One thing that's funny that's now, cool. where DNA technology has come in today's world, all he would need to do is find, like, an old hair on a brush and then analyze mm. that DNA... Versus his current DNA, and then figure out a method to splice out the extra. Like, right. I think that's interesting that like he wasn't too far off from where science would actually be in a few years. But at the same time, I don't understand how it would splice him in with the teleporter itself. That I checked out a little bit on the science there. <laughs> yeah, the yeah, science and... of teleportation is is a well established <laughs> field right now. Right, exactly. <laughs> Um, it's the, like Facebook the or FaceTime. The solution for me was kind of, uh, you know, the solution to... I, I, I found it weird that at the end he chose his girlfriend and his baby to try and splice himself with. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Why He's like, oh, we can live all three together as one thing. And I'm like... Mm, Maybe it was a suicide pact. Uh, well, it's weird Yeah, because that's what it felt like, yeah. right? By taking out the scene of him combining the cat and the baboon or whatever you don't establish that as even an option on purpose right and so actually now that you've mentioned that scene his end goal actually does make more sense within the story because he's not trying right. to cure himself with the baby and the girl he wants to combine them 
Right, right, because he knows it's not going to cure, but it might, I don't know. To be together forever. (sighs) Oof. But it is, to me, that even though it's a little hokey, all the effects and everything, there's still some humanity there that I can get behind. Like, to watch him put that gun to his head. Yep. To me, that as, as... as a movie fan and as an actor fan, like to see those kind of things yes. in a special effects science fiction horror movie, to have that emotion still there, it, it, it's what separates. Yeah, you it's know, like Silence of the Lambs from. Yeah, it's other it's movies. a it, what it said to me was even as a creature that is mostly fly, the gun to the head portion What's was the humanity this there? is the best solution. Right, do it. Right, end this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right, because how I was going to end it wasn't the right solution. Right. This is the right solution to yeah. It's all that's always touched on in like werewolf movies and stuff. Like, you know, yes, do I just save everybody the anguish by putting a bullet in my head? Yes, but no, they never do. They <laughs> <laughs> they always do the other thing. I mean that that is definitely I I, I totally agree with everything you're saying because that is definitely one of the things that stood out for me with this film when I first watched it. Less so now because I expected it, and also it's probably a more played out trope now than it ever was back then. Mm-hmm. But just the amount of tragedy in the hero, you know, really Jeff is supposed to be the hero of the film. Like mm-hmm. everything is circling around this brilliant geek scientist who's. You know, figured all this stuff out and look at the tragedy that unfolds and the horror, and it wasn't a happy film. It uh, horror films rarely are happy, but they normally have right. some kind of positive resolution. Like even if there'll be like a sort of after credit scene, and by the way, Travis, uh, my wife needs to uh, kill you about an after credit scene. I just let, let you know that now. Uh, <laughs> I made her sit through the Batman uh, oh. after credits. <laughs> Because I was like, I hear there's an after credit scene. No, here. no, 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 no. I never said watch the after credits. <laughs> Did I? You, you mentioned it somewhere. And I was like, I know that there's an after credit scene. You may not have said watch it, but you may have just mentioned there was one. So I made her sit through it. And, and oh, that shit. Did. No, I would have completely told you there's no way credit scene. <laughs> 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 well, there kind of is, but you have to, no, be, there is, you have to pay attention cool. to it. Yeah, yeah it and, cool. and it is kind of cool. But uh, yeah, she was not happy. She was like, oh, we are the only tell, ones tell left in this cinema. I'm like, I've got it on good authority. Trust me. But <laughs> No, I said the movie is great, but I don't remember ever saying wait for the end credits. I might have said there, don't wait. <laughs> I don't know. I'll have to go back and look. I, it, no. I might not have had my reading glasses on then. I Googled that, it in the theater con- as the credits started. Like, do I need to stay here? And yeah, oh, I don't. We did I the same thing. Stay here. But there's yeah, no there's... internet in my movie theater. Otherwise, <sighs> I would have done the same. I'm like sat there going, no, no, no. I'm sure this will be fine. No. Yes, no, they, yes, it's gonna be brilliant. Oh shit, is that it? They did a thing where, yeah, you can you can look things up on the on the internet. Yeah, but anyhow, yeah. Uh, no, the Tell the, the sheer <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> I just remembered it to you. <laughs> the sheer tragedy of of this story and and like the kind of arc of it is what like left moviegoers back then thinking it was brilliant. It wasn't again. Yeah, wasn't your typical Hollywood. Uh, here's a serial killer. Oh, he's dead. Or is, or he, is you know, he? It was, eh, yeah. So. But to me, as a fan, like when I watched, like I said before, when I watched the Peter Jackson remake of King Kong, I watched it, and I was like all excited about the things I was catching, all the homages and whatever. When I watched this movie, if you know the original, that ending scene is in the original. So it's like, you know, when when Jeff Goldblum says, "Help me, please help me." That's right from the original movie where uh, uh, Andre says that to his wife, but he can't talk, so he says it in a different way at the end of the movie as a fly stuck in the web. But he says, help me, please help me. And and Andre is killed by his wife by the press. So, mm-hmm. like the actual compressor. So she kills him to save him, and he tells her to kill kill me by laying on the press. He can't tell he can't tell her to kill him, but he lays on the press and kind of points at the thing to press the button. And then he lays there again and he waits for her to press the button. So it's like in a nineteen fifty eight way, it was the same motion as the fly yeah. putting the gun to his own head. Uh so that was an homage. It wasn't anything I was expecting when that happened, I was like, Oh, okay, good. They kept the humanity of the creature yeah. at the end, which is good. 
See, I haven't actually. Don't think I've seen the original film. I've just. It's good. I'd watch it if I were you. I, it's, I, it's I think a... I've seen clips of it for sure, and I've definitely seen the Simpsons version of it. Yeah. Right. Right. But I'm trying to like rack my brain here to think. Have I actually seen it? And I, I'm trying to just have a little. I'm not sure I have. It's got Vincent mm. Price. I mean, it's worth a watch. I mean, anything with Vincent Price in it is worth yeah. a watch. Even Alice Cooper's Welcome to My Nightmare. <laughs> to me, it kind of reminded me of if you watched Leave at the Beaver when you were a kid. That didn't make it over to the UK. Okay, so Ward and June Cleaver are like the 1950s quintessential mom and dad in the 1950s suburbs, like just the the every man family. Yeah. If you picture Ward I've Cleaver. I've seen One Division. I know what American okay, TV is like. There you go. So <laughs> if you picture Ward Cleaver, who was the dad, in the basement experimenting with gene splicing and and trans teleportation like he's he was experimenting that in the basement and then one day uh he doesn't come upstairs and june goes downstairs and sees a note on the door saying do not enter (laughs) because something went wrong and then eventually they start talking to each other through the door and then she makes her way in and then she eventually tries to help him and then the reveal of his face being a fly and also like it's basically if you took the leave it the beaver and this movie from back then, <laughs> it, it's it's really you interesting. You put them in a to teleporter the... together, and then out the other no, end they comes never... this movie. Well, he no, it doesn't. I don't even know if he tries to. I know he goes through the machine and the flies in the machine, but they don't. He doesn't try to keep doing it to try to fix it uh, to himself. Eventually, he does, and she helps him, and he comes out, and he's not any different. And then the reveal is that he looks like the fly, and then that's when, you know, she tries to help him and then eventually the humanity takes over and then she puts him down but it's like the reveal of they were all telling the truth the whole time is that you know the fly that spliced with him ends up in a spider web and then you get that classic help me scene where yeah. the, the fly in the web is saying help, help me, me. Right. Help yeah, me. me right and Which I was the reason why that, that delivery in this movie I was kind of hoping at some point somehow I would get the high pitched Help me. I didn't. Same with the yeah, be afraid. I don't think it was needed. Be very afraid. Be very afraid. Right? Which right. is like in pop culture. But when she delivers it in the movie, she's like, be afraid. Be very afraid. And I'm like, come on. Like, give me I a little I think she delivered more. a line okay. <laughs> it was pretty flat. I, I was fine with that I delivery. Because it was, because her, her delivery wasn't more like that 1950s kind of, you know, I don't know, gusto kind of delivery. She was more like just disgusted that he brought that woman there to do what had already destroyed him because she had information. She knew that he was not right. It just sounded like and, a George Clooney. I'm Batman. You know, it's like mm. you could put a little more in that George, please. Yeah. Was he, I think was George, he ever, George knew was he, he was making ever Batman? crap. I've forgotten. Yeah. He was a Batman. <laughs> okay. I've forgotten him. I've forgotten Val Kilmer. It's worth I've, forgotten I've both forgotten of those. That other dude. Let them yeah. remain <laughs> unremembered. Dude. You mean Bale? That's the one, yeah. I've mm. I'm kind of I've kind of forgotten him now. No, Chris. It's all about Pattinson. Yeah, the new one's really good. George he, hasn't he, seen it yet. We're gonna get him there. Oh, the scene, yes. the scene no with Two Face is amazing. Um, yeah. <laughs> did you know there was an opera uh, based on The Fly, right? No. And it was a two-act opera composed by the composer of the score for The Fly. Howard Shaw, now I did mention at the beginning that it had quite uh, an amazing score. He made an opera of it and then went on to do, I don't know, films like Lord of the Rings, so I guess he knows something about music, but how can you make an opera out of this film? Hmm. Like, I'm assuming it's all in I'm I'm assuming it's all in English for a start, so that would be better. It's a two hour long opera. They made a musical of King Kong, so I guess anything's possible. Yeah, now I just think... Yeah, I mean, whatever... whether it's good or not is a different story, but... Oh, it was acclaimed. I didn't see it, but... Oh, word. Seth Brundle is the bass baritone. Nice. Veronica Quaif is the mezzo-soprano. And Stathis Barans is the tenor. St- I mean... Brent. It's crazy. <laughs> I, 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 I can't imagine this as an opera. Like, I'm, I'm thinking of, like, the chorus... Of them all thinking, he's vomiting, he's vomiting. How, how, the, how the hell do you turn this into an opera? It's uh, 
unreal, but I want to see it. Um, was directed by David Cronenberg as well, so uh, may- maybe it's just a joke. But yeah, apparently they did an opera. Huh, nice. George, I'm going to send you a link of all the uh, clips from the original Fly so you can check them out okay. when, when you want. I mentioned uh, I hadn't seen this movie before, and so watched it yesterday, took my notes, had a, had a fine time. Ending is what it is and pretty pretty extravagant ending, ending really, with all all things considered. And then this morning I woke up and just like first thought in my head was, Oh wait, they never resolved the baby. Uh, that's because there's a sequel. Well, and that—that that was my second <laughs> thought. Was oh, and this must yeah. be why there's a fly too. And I, I watched the trailer, yeah. and I was right. But I thought it was interesting that the movie just like didn't even tease. You know, there wasn't even like a quick smash zoom on her on her uterus or something. Be like, oh, but we didn't get the baby out. You know, just interesting <laughs> that that's like the whole plot of Act Three, right? Get her out of the hospital, and she's gonna have the thing, and they're gonna take her out, and he steals her, and the guy cuts his hand, which will surely immediately become important to the plot you know just interesting <laughs> to in the movie and then be like just save it for the sequel don't even tease the sequel is is good because eric uh not eric roberts um eric stoltz was it? stoltz eric stoltz plays the brundle's son and he's very good in it but again it suffers from the same issue that this does that the the effects just uh it's just an '80s effects type situation where they 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 go to that puppeteering kind of thing where they just could have just stuck with the characters doing character shit and it would have been fine. But the full transformation is again suffers a little bit. But it's very it's very well acted. But it's clearly a sequel. I don't really remember. I have seen the sequel. I don't remember much about it. That might have to go on my list. Uh, I was just reading a little bit about the guy who wrote the original Fly, George Langelan. Uh, he was a friend of the famous British occultist Alistair Crowley. Oh, this ooh. kind of explains everything now. Yeah, a little yeah. bit. I'm kind of like, yeah, all right, this was one of your heroin trips. Fair enough. Now I understand. <laughs> well, as we wrap up the Fly, I think we should thank Richard. For joining us, Richard, from the Chasing Tone podcast, which everybody a pleasure, should always. listen to, Thank because you. even if they don't talk about guitar stuff all the time, uh, it's all entertaining radio. Thank you very That's much. True. Yeah, do check us out on every platform that supports podcasts. Pretty mm. much. Should we tell George what he's watching next week, Travis? Uh, I believe Richard brought brought it up, oh. but uh, I will reiterate. We are going to watch a movie. Okay. That that uh you probably should have seen but haven't. That kind of plays in the what we're uh, That's the idea. What we've been doing. Okay. Uh I'll just it's a three letter word. Okay. And it's called Saul. Really? Yes. I don't think we're gonna watch the whole Well, isn't there like seventeen There's, like 19 saws? Of them, yeah, There's yeah. too many. We'll watch the first one and call it good. Watch the first one. The first wow. one is genius. I, I mm. remember seeing it. Again, when it came out, probably on DVD. Uh, I think it was one of the early DVD films. But uh, me and my wife love horror films, and we were like, this is one of the best horror films we've seen for a long time. So you're in for a treat there. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it kind of plays in our wheelhouse, because we just did seven. And Okay, you know, yeah. fine. Yeah. yeah. That's and a this, great uh, film, too. And, and Saw, correct me if I'm wrong, but like Saw is pretty new. Compared yeah. to what you know, what we normally normally watch, yeah, right, and it kind of plays into the, the the feel of the Batman as well. So we probably should watch it. Okay, yeah, and All we should right. watch the Batman as well. I think we will. Well, think by so. the time this yeah. episode airs, we will already have an episode on it. So, yeah, hey, hey, oh, assuming that's, you that's don't cancel like time again. traveling, amazing. Yeah, we're gonna do some time travel. <laughs> oh yeah, I hope we come out the other side <laughs> all. <laughs> Mixed up <laughs> DNA wise. <laughs> Back to episode one. <laughs> uh, oh my gosh, are we gonna like break something in like the time space continuum? continuum? I don't know. It all depends on whether sure you, you actually make it to the movies this week. So I think we should just take our cell phones to the theater and record a live reaction. <laughs> I think everyone else in the theater will appreciate that. I don't think there's gonna be a lot of people in there. Everybody saw it already. I don't think so. <laughs> Especially oh, those people that come around at half time with like the infrared goggles looking for you filming stuff. They're, they'll be very oh, yeah. happy to see you in there filming and your reaction. Well, it'll be after the movie's over. So, 
<laughs> Make sure you wait for the end credit scene. <laughs> right, exactly. We're going to record during the end credit scene. There, there you go. Fantastic. I'm going to go back and see what I wrote. Cause <laughs> I don't remember <laughs> saying that. I remember saying... If, I uh, might have seen it early in the morning, so I've got okay. you know rubbish vision first thing in the morning. <laughs> I need to work on that. Guys, it's been a, a pleasure once again, uh, and thanks for making me watch a film that I haven't seen for ages uh, and I've totally forgotten and is genius. And uh, yeah, I look forward to hearing uh, this episode and many more episodes to come, guys. Thank oh, you. Thank you so thank much, you, Richard. Richard. Tell everybody we say hey. I will do. Be safe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Have you heard what's going on in Europe? Not a good time to be safe. Anyhow. Thank you for joining us on the Remedial Film Class Podcast. As always, you can find us at facebook.com slash remedialfilmpod, or you can find us at Twitter and Instagram at remedialfilmpod. Heck, you can even email us remedialfilmpod at gmail.com. We'll be back next week with the classic, newish for our show, movie, Saw.